Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church Front Royals Worship Online Service. Today is the fifth Sunday of Lent as we journey together toward the cross. Even though we cannot be together in the sanctuary worshiping with each other, let me just say I sure do miss each of you seeing you. I, I really miss you terribly. But even though we cannot be together in worship this day, we know that God will be present worshiping with, me, with us in our worship. Someone said that if the Bible was written today, Matthew 18 would say, for where two or three gather in my name through online worship, there I am. So let us worship together. trust in you, we put our faith in you. And Lord, for all that we do, we just pray that the time that we spend, whether it be at home or in fellowship here today, we just pray that all things are done for your glory and that we lift you up as our Lord and Savior. Be with us now as we begin. For it's in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen.
of Danimal friends have decided to join me here on the steps. And I see Olaf did not come today. I think he might have been a little embarrassed last week that his arms were a little too short to cover his eyes. But we have lots of other friends that are with us today. Um, boys and girls at home and stuffed animals, can you see this poster here? Can you see it, stuffed animals? So what is it? What's on there? A raccoon, and he's hanging on by his fingernails, hanging on that log. And then below it, it says, hang in there. Well, have you ever felt like that, stuffed animals? You were wondering how you were going to hang on? Well, I have felt like that over the last few weeks. I have felt like I was just hanging on a branch ready to fall off. Everything has changed so much in our lives. Maybe you feel the same way. A number of you are not able to go to school and be with your friends and your teacher. You cannot go outside or go over to friends' houses and play with your friends. And you can't go out to eat. You can't go shopping. Our neighbor told us a story about taking his son to the soccer park, and they were playing soccer, and then another family showed up with a little girl, and they were playing. And then all of a sudden, the, our little neighbor boy and the little girl saw each other and started running to each other because they wanted to play with each other. And then the parents had to say, no, we can't play together right now. How sad and how opposite of what we normally say. We, we usually encourage you to play with others and to be kind and to share. So with all that's going on these days and with all the changes and with all that you might hear on the news, I want to remind you, like our raccoon here, to hang in there. And I want you to remember that Jesus is with you, helping you to hang on. So will you please pray with me now, boys and girls and my stuffed animal friends. Let's pray together. God, we are confused, scared, and lonely. Thank you for being with us, for being our friend, and for helping us to hang in there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I'll be reading from Psalm 130, verses 1 through 6. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice and supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark my iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word I hope, my soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, how was your week? Was it long and difficult, maybe boring or trying? And if you're living with others, I imagine that you have probably gotten a little tired of each other. Maybe you've gotten on each other's nerves. And if you're living alone, maybe you have been afraid, or maybe you have been lonely, or maybe you've been irritated because no one has checked on you. Maybe you've spent time gossiping on the phone. So how was your week? Where did you fall short? Where did sin creep in? So I invite you now to take a few moments of silence to talk with God about your sins. During Lent, we remember the events that led up to the crucifixion. Jesus had come into the world to bring hope and life, but at every step, there were those who could not accept the power of that life. 
He came to create a new relationship between God and human beings, but there were those who had other ideas. Because he could not be manipulated, they sought to kill him. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read, When Jesus had finished teaching, he said to the disciples, In two days, as you know, it will be the Passover festival, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. The chief priest and the elders met together in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, and made plans to arrest Jesus secretly and put him to death. We must not do it during the festival, they said, or the people will riot. Then one of the twelve disciples, the one named Judas, went to the chief priest and asked, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They counted out thirty silver coins and gave them to him. From then on, Judas was looking for a good chance to hand Jesus over to them. Betrayed by a kiss from a friend for thirty pieces of silver, anyone could have been the one. Jesus came as the truth, but it was too brilliant for those who liked the darkness. As a small bag of coins was traded from hand to hand, a little of the light that had come into the world went out. Friends, forgiveness comes from the Lord, who hears our cries. Our sins are forgiven. Please pray with me. God of morning and evening, God of sunshine and rain, you possess all the rhythms of our lives. In the evening, as we go to sleep, you are the cradle of the world. And in the morning, as we wake up, you are our comforter. You are here when we go to sleep, and you are waiting when we wake up. You are the source of all that is good and kind and compassionate in our world today. You are the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of our faith. And we claim that faith this morning, convinced that it is real, not by the persuasion of our minds, but by the stories our lives are writing. We believe and trust in you, O oh God. But sometimes the days are fragile, and our language is composed of sighs because we know that there are no words. Our vision is blurred because we do not know what this week or the next will bring. Even when our faith is strong, we feel the pain of others, and it reminds us that we do not move through this life alone. While we are separated from so many we love, we are reminded that you travel with us. For lo, you are always with us, even to the end of the age. And it is with this confidence that we now mention aloud to those we are worshiping with at home, or we type them in the comments section on our Facebook page, those who we pray for. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think we need a few cards. What do you think?
Thank you, musicians, for sharing with us this week and in the past weeks. It is odd, isn't it, having to sing and play with, with just a, a video audience. Um, I was telling the folks as we got together this morning that I never, never learned in seminary how to be a tele-evangelist. So I guess we're all trying to figure this out together. So our scripture reading from, for our sermon comes from the book of John, chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. It's quite a long passage, but I think it's important to hear the whole story. You have to make it to the end of the story. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with her perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, Jesus stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, but those they see who see the light of this world. But those who are walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will not be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then, Je Je then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is not dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. But Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? 
Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was laying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you were always with me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing so that they might believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped up in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I have to admit, when I was studying this passage from John and reading what scholars had to say about this passage, I got a little mad. Because one scholar wrote these words, One of the greatest hindrances to imagining possibilities is perpetual distortion. Obstacles appear larger and more ominous than they are, keeping us preoccupied with trying to avoid danger rather than discerning alternatives. Obstacles appear larger than they are and more ominous than they are? What? Obstacles are all around us and they are ominous. This virus that is floating around is killing people. It's extremely contagious. We are all trying to do our best to stay at home and prevent catching it or giving it to someone else. Businesses have shut down. Adults who are lucky to still have jobs are working from homes and kids are not able to go to school. We are all wiping down our groceries. We're throwing out our to-go containers of food before growing, bringing them into the house. We're trying to stay six feet away from our friends. And we've not worshipped in our sanctuary now for three weeks. This virus is a huge obstacle. And it is extremely dangerous. Of course, I was taking what the scholar wrote out of context. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. And this scholar I was reading was writing pre-COVID-19 pandemic. From now on, everything that is written will be different. We will think in terms of pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. What we are experiencing now is going to change how we view the world and how we view each other. I imagine that those who witnessed Lazarus' rising from the dead changed how they viewed the world and how they viewed Jesus. Jesus is good friends with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. The sisters send word to Jesus that Lazarus has fallen ill. But instead of hurrying, hurrying to Bethany, Jesus stays where he is and then travels in a few days. When he finally gets close, Martha hears that Jesus is arriving, and she meets him and says, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus has arrived too late. Lazarus isn't just sleeping as the disciples suppose. He's dead. And if he had come in time, Martha bargains when she goes to meet him that perhaps her brother would not have died. She adds that she knows that God will still give Jesus whatever he asks, but her proclamation still rings hollow. She responds to Jesus' promise of resurrection life with a vague and depressing affirmation, saying, these things will be on the last day. 
She can't hold up much hope, for her brother is dead. By contrast, Mary, perhaps, she is angry and doesn't want to come out to meet Jesus. She stays behind at home, waiting for him, for him to come to her. I imagine her pacing back and forth in her house, fuming, furious for Jesus' delay in coming. Only at the private urging of her sister, and only after Jesus asks about her specifically, does she finally come out to meet him. When she does, Mary offers the same bargaining accusation her sister used. Jesus could have prevented this tragedy, but now it is too late. And her anger and her depression spill over into tears. Jesus has no clever response. Instead, he asks to see the tomb, and then he begins to weep. That short verse, Jesus wept, or as the New Revised Standard Version says, Jesus began to wept, shows that Jesus is truly one of us, a human with real feelings and emotions, and he is overcome with grief because his friend has died. Jesus is deeply moved. He feels the same way we do when someone we love. The sadness and raw emotion of Jesus' experience is a consequence of the Incarnation. He became like us, one of us, and experienced the great joys and the great sorrows of what it means to be human. So my friends, what is causing you to weep? Over the last few weeks, perhaps you have cried because you are lonely. Perhaps you have cried because you no longer have a job. Or perhaps you have cried because your child had to come home from college. Or your child would not, not get to finish his senior year of high school or attend the prom or graduate. Perhaps someone you love is sick and you have not been able to be with them. This day, as we stand in the midst of this pandemic, Jesus stands with us, weeping. Raising Lazarus from the dead is John's last sign in his book of signs. These signs point to who Jesus really is and the nature of God's way in the world. And this sign, the most miraculous of all of them, leads to Jesus' arrest. By defeating death, Jesus has upset the laws of nature and the way that things should be. It is the last straw. Ironically, Jesus giving life to another leads to his own death. The raising of Lazarus from the dead foreshadows the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In short time, Jesus will be arrested, crucified, and laid in his tomb. And then three days later, he will rise from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is a permanent one. It is the final defeat of death. Jesus rose from the dead and continues to live to this day. But with the rising of Lazarus, Death is defeated for a time. It is temporary because he will eventually die again, this time for good. While Lazarus' resurrection was a temporary one, Jesus' resurrection was a permanent one. We are desperate for resurrection in the lives of ourselves and in the lives of those in our community. We are desperate for God's presence in the nowness of our existence. All around us, fear is swallowing us. Death is coming for us all, whether from this virus or from some other cause. So we all need the gift of new life. We need resurrection. 
The war in Syria wages on. Opioids continue to ravage our country. The EDA and town government are still in conflict. And now COVID-19 has taken over our lives. We need new life. We need resurrection. Jesus called Lazarus out of that tomb where he was dead. And let me just say, he was not just dead. He was stinky dead. Because it had been four days since he took his last breath and his heart beat its last beat. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus stood up, walked out of the tomb, all wrapped up from head to toe with strips of cloth. Jesus called his name, and new life came. Not figurative new life, but real new life came to him. Lazarus is unbound, and he's freed. So what happens to us when Jesus calls our names? Jesus is busy calling us out of all of our tombs. Jesus wants to unbind us and free us. We can anticipate being called to unbind those things in our lives we thought were long dead. Fred Craddock, the famous, famous preacher, once said, in light of the gospel, the one unforgivable sin is to be dead. Craddock also tells of a minister who, becoming terribly frustrated at his church with its lethargy, said one Sunday night at the service, why don't we all form a circle, hold hands, and attempt to communicate with the living? Years ago, a woman writing in the personal ads in the newspaper was looking for far more than a relationship. This is what she wrote in her ad. I'm a 58-year-old woman with doctors tell me only one year to live. I would like to spend that year doing something meaningful, interesting, and fun. I like C-SPAN, Bill Moyers, Times Crossword Puzzles, Nina Totenberg, Anna Quinlan, and Nevada. I don't like George Will, R.J. Reynolds, Computer Talk, Fundamentalist, or California. I have limited stamina and resources. Have you any ideas how I can spend this year making a difference? So what would you suggest to this woman? Would your answer to her be different today than it would have been a month ago before life changed as we know it? Jesus has the power to bring life even in places where death's shadow is looming and is dark. Jesus brings the promise of future resurrection into the present. Death has no power today or tomorrow over those who trust and love him. Jesus brings about eternal life into the here and now. Abundant life is given. Jesus weeps with us, calls us by name, and calls us to life anew. Resurrection is waiting for us all. Let it be so in our lives. Amen. Just a few matters of common concern for for our congregation that is gathered this day. The first is that on Wednesday at three o'clock, we are going to have a Bible study through Zoom. So Kayla will send you a link, and I want you to try to log in, and then I will be talking about Jesus' last words on the cross at three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. If you have any questions about how to log in to watch the Zoom um, Bible study, please call the church office and Kayla can walk you through how to do that. Um, it will be a Zoom call, so we will be able to see each other. So make sure that you do put on some clothes, not just wear your PJs.
<laughs> so I hope that you will join us as we try to figure out new ways to be together during this time. Also, we do have the ability for groups who would like to get together through Zoom. Just let me know and we can set up. If you have a small group, a Bible study, a Sunday school class that would like to meet, just get in touch with the church office and we can help you figure out how to do that. We are continuing to serve large numbers of people in our community with free meals Monday through Thursday. We are now also going to start serving on Saturday. This past Wednesday night, we served 62 people. So people are hungry. Um, we have seen faces and met new people that we've never met before. So we anticipate the numbers continuing to grow in the days ahead. Which brings me to something that we often don't like to talk about, and that is money. So we encourage you during this time of not being able to gather in person, that you would continue to give to the church to help support the ministries of this church, and in particular, helping to feed people. So there's several ways that you can give. One is that you could put um, your envelope and mail it to the church office. Another is there is a drop slot on First Street. You can just drop it through the door and we will get it. You can also go to our website and give online through Tithely. It's very simple to follow through. Um, you just follow the directions. So thank you so much for your willingness to support the church during this time. And please know that, that you are in our thoughts and prayers, and if there's anything that we can do to assist you, please call the church office and let us know, or let your deacon know. So friends, as we conclude this time of worship together, and as we go about our work and our lives, Know that God is with you, that God loves you, that God is calling you by name. May the love of God, the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and in the days to come.